Hey everyone, it's Pastor Josh again, and I'm glad to be with you for week two of Wholeness. I hope you were encouraged through the group discussion last week in engaging the eight dimensions of wellness assessment. This week, we'll be diving a bit deeper into the concept of whole brain discipleship that we introduced last week, particularly as it relates to our right brain. We want to discuss and ingrain in each one of us the ingredients of healthy community and connection and how that leads to character transformation. For much of the following material, I am indebted to the book, The Other Half of Church by Jim Wilder and Michael Hendricks. Generally speaking, let's discuss how our brains work. We take in all of our information through the back of our right brain first. Everything from our senses heads towards this location. Then it moves towards the front of our right brain before it jumps hemispheres to the front of our left brain before ending in the back of the left side of our brain. Our right brain works faster and more often than our left side. Typically, we think of people as being either right brain or left brain dominant. That is, left brain individuals excel in mathematics and the sciences, while the right brain individuals are more creative and enjoy the arts and beauty. While there is some truth to this, everyone has a right and left side of their brain, and each side is responsible for more than what we just excel at or enjoy. As it comes to no surprise, the left side of our brain is responsible for conscious thought, speech, strategies, problem solving, and logic, and also stories. This is reasonable given what we know about people who tend to be left-brained. What might come as a surprise is what the right side of the brain is responsible for, and that is individual identity, answering the question, who am I? Group identity, who is the group I'm a part of or the group that I want to be a part of? Emotional attunement to others, assessment of our surroundings. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they scary? And also our relational attachments. All of these are extremely important when it comes to our walk with Christ, our relationship to the church, and living life as a witness to the gospel. Left brain exercises that focus on right beliefs, willpower, right strategies, or right actions will only result in growth and wholeness when our right brains are healthy. When we fail to inspect our right brains, the health of our emotions, our identity, and our relational attachments, we can become flustered when we don't see growth in ourselves or others. Often, left brain dominant discipleship neglects loving attachments, joy, emotional development, and identity. Without these core needs, we can be Christians who believe in God's love, but have difficulty truly experiencing it in daily life especially during distress. Does that describe you or loved ones you know? If so, there's hope because God designed us for more and designed us to know him with our minds, but also experience and enjoy him with our hearts too. So how do we know if our right brain are healthy? In a few moments, you'll complete the soil assessments from the other half of church. But before then, I wanna provide a brief introduction to the soil and the nutrients that are so essential for your right brain to function at max capacity. The first ingredient that we'll discuss is joy. Think for a moment about how you would describe joy. Is it an emotion? Is it a feeling? Is it a disposition? Is it an attitude? Well, it, it's an emotion, right? It's a feeling of gladness. But what separates joy from happiness? It's relationship. Joy is emotional and relational. It's an emotion that's experienced when I'm glad to be with someone and I know they're glad to be with me. In the Old Testament, this is expressed through God's face and presence. In the blessing recorded in number six, God tells Aaron to bless the people by saying, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and lift up his countenance or his face upon you. The idea of God's face shining, beaming with joy with you, and in lifting up his face are used in the scripture to describe God's gladness to be with his people. And unlike the Old Testament, where the people disobeyed and were ultimately exiled from the land because of it, we are New Covenant or New Testament believers. This means that because of Jesus, his death and resurrection, our sins have been completely wiped away and thrown as far as the east is from the west. 
Now, in Christ, God is glad to be with us. Our sin has been taken care of. Because God created us to be in right relationship with Him and created our brains to run on joy, it makes sense that He would speak of Himself in this way and that a part of our redemption would be fulfilled in an experience of true relational joy with our Creator. Jim Wilder says, feeling joy in our bodies indicates that our right brain is functioning smoothly. When we lose this bodily connection, it is a sign that our brain is not running well. So the question is, do I consistently have relational joy, both with God and with His people? If not, let's dig into why relational joy is so difficult. But before that, why is joy so foundational? Well, because of its relational nature. If I know that someone is glad to be with me, then I can process my grief, my anger, my fear, and every other emotion in light of this relational, relational connection. This is why joy is paramount for building lasting and life-giving Christian community, and as a result, growing as a disciple of Jesus. The second ingredient is love, and particularly the kind of love that is most described of God towards us and seen in the community of his people, chesed. This is a committed and sticky type of love. If joy is relational and expressed, I'm glad to be with you, then chesed love is relational glue that says, I'm on your team, I'm for you, and I'm not leaving. Our brains and character are formed most deeply by those we are most attached to. For those of us who struggle to connect or have had trauma and past wounds from relationships, especially with our earthly parents, it can wreak havoc in our spiritual growth. This is why the church is called to be a high joy, sticky, attached group of people who are glad to be with one another and deeply committed to one another that we would all grow in Christ. When we don't have this, our relationships can be purely transactional and performance-based. We don't believe God's people, or worse, God himself, that he doesn't love us and we're not performing well enough. We may even be friendly or enthusiastic to others, but don't experience deep attachment to them or from them. Based on our past, we may either be too afraid to open up ourselves to this kind of love or truly don't know how. But it's not about doing this perfectly or even knowing how, but rather being committed to seeking joy and chesed love now, in this place, in your relationships and in your community. With the foundational building blocks of relational joy and sticky chesed love disgust, we move on to who we are called to be our, or our group identity. Our right brain contains the control center that interprets our group identity and uses it to shape our inner character. It can be easy for our group identity to be dictated by culture, politics, hobbies, or interests. But the main purpose of the church as the body and bride of Christ is that our group identity is defined by Jesus himself. That we each would embody his teachings, imitate his character, and be conformed to his image by the Spirit. And we as a community committed to joy and love with one another have the privilege and the responsibility to hold one another to that standard. And this leads to the last ingredient, healthy correction. Correction is not looked highly upon in our world today. We can be accused of being hypocritical, judgmental, and the like. But at the heart of healthy correction is restoration to group identity, which is Jesus. And the difference between unhealthy and healthy correction is that it's done with joy and love, not condescension or hate. It affirms the relationship between each other and with Christ and highlights where someone isn't acting like Jesus, and then graciously and gently points them back to their true identity in Him. Now that we've discussed the four main ingredients to make sure our right brain is healthy, that is relational joy, sticky love, group identity based on Christ, and healthy correction within the community, we'll now have you complete the soil assessment. This will be a series of questions in each of these four categories for you to reflect and answer based on how much joy, love, group identity, and healthy correction you are receiving. And after the assessment, you'll have a chance to share with the group both your strengths, weaknesses, and where you can see growth, an opportunity for growth within our own community.